Magma-Size Google Hangouts with distinguished lecturers. I'm Katie Burke. I'm associate editor at American Scientist Magazine. And this particular Google Hangout with Dr. Sandra Hansen from the Catholic University of America is sponsored by the University of Arkansas Fayetteville. So hello to the members of the chapter. Hello. Um, as well as other Sigma Psi members and followers on social media who are joining us. Um, so for those who are new to this talk format, uh, you can ask us questions at any time during this entire question and answer session. Uh, so look for a chat window on the right side of your screen where you can submit questions during the talk. And if you're a Sigma Psi member, you can also submit follow-up questions after the Hangout by going to the Sigma Psi Communities page, the lab, and then we'll send on those questions to Dr. Hansen. So today we're excited to have Dr. Hansen with us. She's a social scientist who studies gender and racial diversity in science and engineering. She has written three books relevant to this discussion, Lost Talent, Women in the Sciences, another called Swimming Against the Tide, African-American Girls in Science Education, and her most recent, The American Dream in the 21st Century. So Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Welcome to my office at Catholic University. <laughs> Thanks. So um, just to get things rolling, you've been studying diversity in science for decades now. Uh, how did you first get interested in the subject? Yeah, well, I started out doing general labor market work on gender and at some point the National Science Foundation was asking for people to do research on women in this part of the labor market, uh, STEM, science, and I thought well maybe if they'll give me money that would be a nice uh, opportunity uh, and along the way I had received help from them to do work on diversity in science Katie, I started out looking at just women in science because uh, that's what NSF was interested in. But along the way, I realized that there was many layers uh, and that, in fact, race and gender are both working um, as fairly large filters in, in who gets into science. So I broadened my interest uh, to look at the processes for both. Yeah, so let's talk about that more. One of the unique aspects of your work uh, is that you have looked at the intersection of gender and race uh, rather than treating them separately as much of the previous work had done. And you said in a recent paper, men and women across race and social class statuses have very different experiences in science. Uh, what did you mean and what are some examples? Yeah, so first just to really state clearly that science is not fair. Um, it used to be thought that just the most qualified people would become scientists and would be doing science. And I can't stress how important it is uh, to have equality of opportunity in science when in fact scientists will be determining our future. Uh, is particularly important and, and social scientists study issues like inequality and if there's not equality if I look at who's doing science and I see that it's mostly white and mostly male then I understand that uh, there's a couple of mechanisms going on there so certainly we can say that women are uh, less welcomed uh, they have a harder time uh, finding opportunities and equality in science, and I can say that about people of color as well, except for Asian Americans who uh, we, we talk about that as a model minority. They're, they're actually overrepresented in science. When I say that you can't just talk about men or women, or you can't just talk about African Americans or whites and Latinos, uh, it's the overlap, that's what you're asking about. Uh, I, one of my books, uh, you mentioned Swimming Against the Tide. This, I interviewed young African American women, and I also looked at the situation for young men. And in that case, the young women 
might see gender barriers. Uh, and some expected they would have double barriers, both on race, because they're not white, and on gender, because they're not male. But what I found so interesting in talking to them is their love of science, their interest in science. They come from a community uh, of African-American women who have always worked. Uh, there's a lot of strength there. They're supported by their families in science, uh, probably more so than the young African-American men who are experiencing a little bit more of a, um, a crisis in school systems, in neighborhoods, uh, in their peer groups. So the pleasant surprise was all of their interest and that it was it was two negatives actually adding up to a positive because they're more interested than young white women. But when they hit the science system, there's so many stereotypes about who is a scientist. They said to me, they're not called on. Uh, they, they feel like they don't look like a scientist, like who's teaching it or who's in the books. So tell me a little bit more. Um, you mentioned in your 2012 paper in the International uh, Journal of Science and Society that Latinos are the fastest growing racial minority groups that earn, um, but that they earn fewer STEM degrees than any other racial or ethnic group in, in the US. Uh, what barriers to entering science do Latinos face and what is being done to change that, if anything? It's a pretty similar process as uh, for African-Americans. It is segregated schools. It's going to schools with less good science equipment, less good science teachers, uh, less resources and lower budgets, less interactive hands-on. Uh, so unfortunately in the US, we have a lot of racial and ethnic segregation. And when you segregate kids and when school systems, budgets are based on the tax base, uh, Part of the issue for African Americans and Latinos is the social class issue. So uh, lower income groups are, are living in neighborhoods uh, that have schools that have a smaller tax base. And those schools have less good science labs and resources. So that's one of the barriers there. Uh, secondly, they look at the textbooks. They don't see anyone like themselves in the science books. They look at the media. The media is not presenting any scientist images that look like them. And we're all um, social beings. We look around us and we see who's doing things that look like me. And if you don't see someone like yourself doing things, then you don't think it's possible for yourself. I think Latinos is going to be a, a shift. I think that uh, on most things, Latinos uh, whether it be income, whether it be education, they are making gains and they're actually gaining on African Americans in many areas of, of social uh, inequality. So I, I think something similar is going to happen in science. Right now, they're probably farther behind in part because of sometimes it's language issues, language barriers. There's stereotypes that are unique about Latinos for example, that uh, they are non-English speaking immigrants. Now that's not true in general, but when you get those stereotypes out there, that's, that's a, a stereotype that is unique to them and that doesn't affect an African American youth. But there's different stereotypes affecting them. So, um We've been talking and, and you've been studying, um, you know, we being the, you know, the scientific community has been talking about women in science for a long time and you've been studying it for a long time. Um, and what are the barriers to women entering science and, and why do some of them still remain? There's been some progress and I, I tell you, I think it's mostly in the education system. We now have a lot of women getting degrees in science. It's less so than for men, and especially in some areas. Uh, there's a culture of science that's somewhat chilly for women, especially in certain areas. I would say that engineering, physics, chemistry are some of the areas in science that women are, are the least represented. So there's something about the culture of 
the uh, area of science itself that it can be more welcoming or less welcoming. They are underprepared. Um, this is true for all excluded groups that in the early years when students start making decisions about the courses that they will take and when they start getting counseling and advising about the careers, girls don't get the same counseling and advising and they don't get put into the same courses and sometimes they choose out of those courses. Then you get into college, you, oh, I'm interested in environmental science, but I see now that I haven't taken the calculus, algebra, the, the whatever chemistry courses in high school. So I talk about a, a science pipeline uh, that has holes in it and, and uh, people are filtered out along the way, especially uh, women and minorities, in part because they're underprepared. Uh, they feel stupid or they, they feel like uh, they're not qualified or you have to take extra courses and go longer in the program. Uh, their teachers are, are mostly male at the college level, although this is changing. Uh, they don't get, they, you have to find a lab, uh, you have to find someone to work with. Uh, people who are hiring for labs tend to hire people that within networks. Women are not in the networks as well. They don't know other women who are scientists who could help them into a network. It's interesting, Katie, that uh, women tend to think that if they're just good at science, if they're very qualified, that they can be competitive. How we get into this elite job is much more complicated than that. It's who you know, it's networks, it's having um, a reference, uh, and in a, a door open. So those are some of the barriers. There's many more, but I, I'll just mention those for now. Thank you. Um, so you already mentioned one of the one of the um, prevailing myths about uh, about um, uh, why science and engineering lack diversity, and that's that that um, you know we like to think you know those of us who who are in science we hold fairness as an ideal and and merit as an ideal and like to think that uh, science is a merit based system, but there is a lot of literature that says it's not. Um, what are some other myths and misconceptions that you commonly see about why science and engineering lack diversity? It's thought to be something that you can't have a family and do this. Uh, there's, there's, well, that only works one way. It's a bit of a double standard. I don't know, you probably heard the phrase, you have to be married to science. That, that assumption is that you will be spending all of your time and very long hours in order to do well and be promoted. Now, when you look at how families are structured in the US still, in spite of women's movements and, and various improvements, women still do have more of the work in the family and childcare. Women scientists feel that they can't have a family if they're going to be competitive. The system isn't set up very well for people with families. Men can have families and feel comfortable because it's expected they're more of the breadwinner, they're more, they're less of uh, the person that's expected to cover both things. So in my mind, any better family policy, not just in science organizations and jobs, but across uh, occupations, perhaps more similar to other countries around the world who, who allow people to both uh, work and have families, good work family policy, I think that alone would create an opportunity for more, more and more women in science. Uh, some of them are turned away because they feel they do want to have a family and the message they are giving is that they probably couldn't in, in order to do well in science. So that's, that's one myth uh, that women are less good in science. That's a, that's a very damaging uh, myth. Uh, a couple of years ago, we may remember uh, the president of Harvard made a statement to a group of economists about boys being better in math. And I say to myself, really, we're back to square one because I thought we'd already gone past that. 
the, the literature is empirically unquestionable that boys and girls have equal ability, aptitude in science, math, engineering, technology, and the scores of young children are very similar. They all love science. It, they all love science, and they're good at it. So as a social scientist, if I, if I show these scores that are the same early on, and then show the divergence that occurs as travel through the science pipeline that ends up in those occupations, uh, you can see that we're losing some time. Let me see what, what my next question, um, what I want my next question to be. Um, so um, we had a question from one of the members of, from, of our communities, um, our Sigma Psi communities page, the lab. Uh, and the question was, what about efforts to correct inequalities? Uh, is there a lag effect that could make inequality look worse than it is? because faculties change slowly in academia and are people studying these trends accounting for that lag effect and have we seen progress? Yeah, I would like to be optimistic and uh, yes, people are studying that and yes, there are lag effects. So it's a very good question. Of course, uh, as that talent is being developed, there's a period of time where they're not quite uh, at the uh, PhD level where they're ready uh, for hiring, but we're kind of past that now. We have a lot of qualified women PhDs. Uh, people used to argue there weren't enough qualified in that area, so that's why we're not hiring them. Uh, we, we can't make that argument anymore. Uh, but the, the lag effect is there, and I wanna say that uh, some of the things that are helping to do that are NSF-funded programs that do mentoring, that make connections with uh, women scientists. One of the most successful things I saw was lunch with a scientist where, where young girls could come to lunch and they brought someone, a physicist, they brought uh, a chemist, and these little girls had cards <laughs> that they were sharing with the scientists and already they understood. So, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the trends show very low progress. So when I say women are 28% of scientists, that number is not that different than five years ago. I am surprised to the uh, person who's asking the very good question that it's not moving faster than it is and the change is happening in education faster. It's the occupations that it, it's the the gatekeepers there and the culture there that is the most resistant to diversity. You also mentioned that um, that there is progress. And so what what has worked to help remove some of these barriers in some places? And um, can you give specific examples where progress has been made at different um, points along the pipeline and and where progress is still needed. Mm -hmm. So there's more women getting science degrees than there was in the past and there's slightly more women scientists. The areas of science degrees are more in the life sciences than in other. If some students or some folks are listening in today might say, well, I've been in a class where there's more women majors than men. That is happening in some areas of biology, uh, life sciences, etc. For one reason or another, those areas are considered to be ones that uh, girls are less intimidated by. Uh, there's almost some thought that uh, uh, life sciences it, it is something that women might be better in, as opposed to uh, something like engineering, mechanical engineering, you can always, you can already tell from just the way that I say that mechanical engineering, an image of a person comes to our mind and people think of it as being mechanical machine. Oh, girls aren't good at mechanical things. So images and stereotypes and cultures uh, vary even though uh, young girls are winning awards in all of these areas. 
in contests, science contests, that's one of the things that makes it so positive. You say, how can I see progress? You're starting to win the awards, the Siemens Award and various other Google had a, a science contest. And so I see the signs of progress, especially in education. I talk to women scientists and I hear still uh, such um, discrimination. Uh, there was an, a study of MIT women scientists a number of years ago, and the young women scientists were quite welcomed. Oh, doing good work, almost patting them on the back. Oh, lovely, you know, very brilliant. When women get, you know, the idea of the glass ceiling, and this happens in science too, when they start getting the grants, getting the promotions, getting more where they're actually competing with their other colleagues, that's when they start experiencing the highest levels of discrimination. So what's been successful there is <laughs> monitoring the culture of science, making sure that it's qualifications, that it's not networks, that there's nothing political, there's nothing uh, that, that it has anything to do with that other than with that person's work that is being used to judge them. And many of us are unaware of the stereotypes we're using. Uh, college kids, when given two articles to read in science, if a male name is on one article and a female name and it's randomly assigned, they will give higher value to the article they think is written by a male. So uh, you, you change those stereotypes by changing the culture of science so that people feel more welcome in it. And once they get there, it's fair. Look, you have to police how systems of promotion and hiring and retention and recruitment and um, uh, mentoring are taking place to be careful that people who may not have even intended this bias are unable to show the bias. So um, speaking of, of policing, uh, this year has been marked by several events that brought sexism to the fore of discussion among scientists. For example, uh, Tim Hunt's sexist comment uh, that's now quite infamous, and the sexual harassment scandal involving renowned astronomer Jeff Marcy, which happened recently. How could these situations have been avoided and do you think they mark progress for diversity in science? Do they mark progress because they were called out and they have fallen from grace? It's a, it's a very small group. Uh, there's many doing the same thing that are, are going undetected or unmonitored. Believe me, it's not this, those two gentlemen that are doing sexual harassment and saying sexually biased things. I, I, I think that when you enter any elite place, the people with power are going to determine what happens to you. We're sometimes afraid to speak up because we're going to be judged, we're going to be promoted, we're going to be tenured by those people. And if those people at the higher level are acting in a certain way that has a gender or a race bias, uh, many times we aren't saying anything, even though we might disagree with it personally, because we fear for our job and for our promotion. Uh, so I, I think it does send a signal. I think it, it, it because many times these things have happened in the past where that person was not ever called out like these two. So it, it's a small uh, move. It, it's such a minority of what's happening. And I wish that uh, somehow maybe organizations could set up groups that would check in a very unbiased, supportive way on how decisions uh, and what kinds of things are being said about the scientists, about the students, and, and just maybe supporting in terms of 
a, a positive diversity approach instead of just policing. Does that make sense that I would like these, these folks who grew up in a bias system, that's all they know is a bias. They're a product of the science bias system to themselves receive help in thinking that diversity is a resource, that diversity makes better science, and that I'm, 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 I need to think about my biases and somehow check them at the door. I, I think it, 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 it's a big task to accomplish what I'm saying, but it, it is possible in some places they're doing it. So we're getting, um a question from the audience. Um, they're asking, do you think the large percentage of Asians in the United States, um, sci in, in US science, um, let, me, let me restate that. Do you think the large percentage of Asi Asians in US science is because of the high number of grad students who matriculate to US universities from Asian countries? Oh, that's an interesting question and insight. That's part of it. Uh, we have very um, selective recruitment, and there's a, a thought that these are, are some of the best graduate students. So our science programs are bringing in large numbers, and in part because our uh, young people aren't applying and going into those programs. Something I should mention, Katie, and, and remind me to get back to your original question, but uh, both boys and girls are, are somewhat exposed to a somewhat negative image of science. If you look at the media and how scientists are presented, uh, there's a, a draw a scientist test where young people or even science teachers are asked, draw a scientist. They're usually male and white, but they look lonely. They look kind of weird. They have Einstein's hair. They're like, got big fat glasses. And they're just with a test tube, not with working with other people. I, we're turning away all young people. We aren't scoring well on science in our country compared to other countries. Girls more than boys, yes, that's true. But I, when, when that question is stated, I think about the shortage of uh, young men as well going into science, such that sometimes we do look for talent from other places internationally, where science is very prestigious in Asia and in Asian American communities. That's part of it, that's not all of it. A, a lot of the Asian talent pool in science education and occupations are Asian Americans that, that are not um, coming as graduate students from other countries. Uh, I mentioned the term model minority earlier. Uh, they almost have the reverse problem of young uh, Latinos or African Americans because it's assumed they'll be good in science. It's assumed that they'll like science. So I also did some research on, on Asian Americans, and some of them say, actually, we prefer uh, something in business or the humanities, or, but our family will not allow it. We go into a classroom and the teacher assumes we're good at it. Maybe I'm not good at it. So that's a positive stereotype that's almost uh, boomeranged because it creates stress whenever any stereotype generalizes about a group of people, it, it has a potentially damaging thing, even though obviously it has helped them rise to the top of science and disproportionately uh, be presented there. Uh, there, there uh, one Asian American youth said to me, um, my parents won't fund me in college unless I go into science. And another one said, we have to work on science homework and activities all the time. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, our, we get in trouble, so we can't have a normal life with friends and with uh, other activities. So I, I'm just suggesting the, the complexity of the uh, model minority is not quite as all advantages either. We have a, another question from the audience. Um, one, one audience member asked you to comment on the challenge of having faculty who come from cultures that do not support the goals being enunci enunciated in your talk? Yeah. Um, the interesting thing on that, good question. And there are cultures that uh, 
have very strong ideas about uh, women and men, and, and sometimes they don't fit into the idea of women in science. I will say at the beginning of my comment, in, in response to that very good question, is that uh, Americans don't fare that well overall on this issue. We think of ourselves to some extent as being ahead of, of many other countries, but when I look globally and I'm comparing across countries, maybe early in the science system, it's, pace, it's, it's Thailand, it's Kyrgyzstan, it's Jordan, where girls are scoring higher and there's less of a gender, gender gap than here. And so our science system is behind many science systems around the world, which makes it hard for both boys and girls, but, but also for girls. But I do know what this uh, question, I, I very much respect the question. And uh, in that classroom where young people are taking a science class from someone from a very traditional culture, that, that is a challenge. And I've been at meetings where I heard uh, a certain scientist from another country say something that uh, minority kids aren't as good in science. So uh, the, the multiple stereotypes sometimes from these traditional cultures are a problem. I, I suggest that young people in that situation uh, continue to ask questions, continue to try to be heard, uh, to continue to try to swim against the tide, as I talk about it in my book, to ask other teachers and administrators uh, and faculty for help, for resources, so that you don't rely on just the feedback from that one person, although it, it could be very damaging and, and very, very difficult to get past that one class. Um, sometimes if you can find that one teacher who is promoting, that's all it takes for a girl to succeed in science is one that's treating her like she could be a scientist, like she is smart in science. And um, so there's plenty of chilly uh, environments and I know it, it is a struggle, but I, I would say that uh, to continue to do your best, to keep a self-concept as a scientist and find people that support that, although that can be hard to do, and if you get a good grade in that class, it doesn't matter what they think about you, really. It really doesn't matter. So, um, you've, you mentioned that you've done some comparisons between other, uh, the United States and other countries. And that um, one of the, the differences that you see is the difference in um, maternity and paternity and family leave policies. Uh, what are some other things that um, the United States can learn from other countries about uh, closing the gender gap in science and engineering? Mm -hmm. When I look at uh, some places, it's unexpected. Uh, Thailand. I mentioned they have one of the largest number of women scientists and, and researchers. So there's not much of a gender gap there. Still, it's more men than women, but it's, it's much smaller. I think what's happening in Thailand? Um, one of the things that all Asian countries are doing is they're assuming boys and girls are both good in science. That, that is such a critical difference from us where we still have teachers, books, media that provide images overall of male scientists, of men as being better in science. So just that alone to assume from the start that all kids, boys and girls, like and are good in science, uh, Asia has it over on us. We, we, we have some history of this idea of women being less good in science that was almost based on an attempt was made to base this on brain differences. There was a lot of data that came out on that that was false. It wasn't proven. It, 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 there is no brain difference 
unmasked and science ability, but science was using bad science. And then that got built into the science system and that affected the, the social cultural ideas about, my goodness, boys have a different brain. No wonder they're better in science. So we can learn by just uh, assuming all kids have equal ability. Now, one thing I will say is that part of the issue in the US is that we do have more diversity than some other countries. And that's a bit of a challenge on, on getting uh, people into science. Science is expensive. Science, you need to go to college, you need to go to graduate school, you have to have funding. Uh, that, that right of way uh, suggests to me that class is also going to be a real problem. And if minorities are more likely to be lower income, then, then they have uh, that problem. So in countries like Scandinavia, where there's less income inequality and there's less poverty, you already have taken away the class disadvantage from people who have a different skin color. So whatever we can improve on general gender and race inequality in any part of the system is gonna make better science. Countries with less gender inequality have less gender inequality in science. So there's more women in parliament. There's better family leave policy. So uh, that's some of the things that they're doing. I, I'll just say on the Thailand question, that they have more problems than us in other areas. So um, in Thailand, it's a class issue. The master status on who goes into science is class. And so lower income people in Thailand are very unlikely to go into science. So there's a big gap there. But of those of the middle number class, anybody, male, female, has the class status to get into science. So the, they have more inequality in one area, but less in the other. So here's another question from the audience. Um, this audience member says, is it possible that the stereotypes are being broken down and maybe in a few decades, this will be far less of an issue? I hope so. I, I do change. If we were to change textbooks alone, I can promise you that it would go faster. Uh, Denver, a group of scientists at Denver did a study not too long ago, funded by NSF. They're still seeing like 70% of pictures in science textbooks are, are male, are white male. Uh, there's so much science being done by so many different people, but it, somehow it's not presented to us in the textbooks. And kids think, that's reality right there. What, what's that, that is science. What the science textbook is telling me, that's who's doing science and that's who can do science. So there's been not a lot of change on those textbooks. Uh, I, I don't know what's stopping it. I, I, I think people believe that that's what we want to see or that's what we're comfortable with and that's what we've always done. So that's just how science textbooks are made. Enough talent is being created that it's going to tip the the uh, equation, if I could use that uh, metaphor. Eventually, I just would wish it's a faster progress. The girls are getting the degrees, especially undergraduate. It falls off at PhD, but they're getting the PhDs. Okay. So we need to keep girls in, somehow retain. How do you retain? You have mentors, you have sponsors, you have links to the scientist. Uh, you, you have enough that outweighs those negative images that you get from some people or from some textbooks. And, and there are people doing that. And there's people that believe that we can only be competitive in science globally if we take all that talent. And as long as we are losing half of our talent, eventually someone will, will realize that we can't be as competitive. And when someone realizes that, like uh, these international uh, organizations, they're going to push against stereotypes and discrimination and say, listen, 
you've got all these people getting these degrees. You need to have them in the science occupations. And if you don't, you might not get funded from us. We might not give you grants. That would be the best way to make any organization change. Uh, Title IX did this in, in uh, public schools. Uh, you can't give different education. You can't, whether it be sports or any area, you can't give gender differences in your education system. You're taking public money. If we did that a little bit better on science education, I think we would see even more change. So you've, you've talked about this a little bit, but um, the answer to this question might seem obvious to some, but uh, it often does come up in discussions on, um, on this subject. Uh, so I think it's worth addressing. Why is diversity in science important? Mm -hmm. I, I love to, to be an outsider. I, I am a scientist. I'm a social scientist. I'm not a physical scientist. So it's much easier for me to look at what uh, you scientists are doing. Maybe than to look at oneself. Uh, it's something, there's like this term fish out of water. You can see something better when you're not inside of it. Um, so, um, will you remind me of your question? <laughs> I was making yeah, a fish metaphor there. <laughs> <laughs> Why is diversity in science important? Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of evidence on uh, what makes for good science and when uh, inventions and, and new theories and uh, new ideas come about. Uh, there was a great book written a couple of years ago about how how has science changed after women started entering it. So there has been a sea change. We do have this 28% of women who are scientists now and uh, in the 70s, for example, we didn't have that. Uh, the author goes, Area by area physics, uh, primatology, math, chemistry, and shows that when a different group came in and started working in this area, the ideas changed. You didn't make the same assumptions. Uh, no, I, I don't agree with you on that just because so-and-so wrote an article 10 years ago. I'm actually looking into that. I have a different viewpoint. I, I, so just being outside of the good old boy network gives someone a freshness and an ability to see above all the assumptions. Scientists make a lot of assumptions. They stop answering and asking questions at some point. If that theory is so well proven, we're, we're not even looking at, okay, we're past that. Someone else comes in, wait a second, I'm seeing something in my study of primates it doesn't suggest that the male is always the leader. And I am doing an observational study that shows something slightly different than those past. Wow, uh, you have just broken open uh, a, an assumption and a limitation where a bunch of people agreed and didn't want to insult anybody else by questioning them. I have nothing to lose, I'm new. I'm outside of the network anyway. I can bring in a question. I can bring in some new ideas. And we know that anything to do with invention, ideas, if you have different points of view, different uh, backgrounds, uh, just think of the interdisciplinary stuff, that many things today, unless people are coming from different disciplines, you will not uh, be able to solve these problems, whether it has to do with the environment, whether it has has to do with uh, issues of, of hunger or issues of, of communication systems. It, it, they go across disciplines. And the more people with different experiences and training and backgrounds, uh, the better is the outcome in science. So um, what, what evidence is there that racial discrimination persists in U.S. science? Can you talk, we've talked a lot about gender, so let's talk a little bit more about um, race and race and gender together. Mm -hmm. 
there is a, a pipeline there as well where there's a lot of interest uh, at a young age uh, by minority kids. Uh, but but that they are not traveling through the science pipeline very successfully. They're falling out along the way. Uh, they are, uh, the class issue is huge there that um, they aren't, uh, minority kids disproportionately are in science classrooms that don't have a lot of uh, interaction, uh, hands-on, uh, good equipment, and um, uh, racism in science goes way back. Racism was built into science. Uh, it was sometimes uh, supported by science, uh, whether it was the old stuff on brain size or whatever, that uh, it, it's racist. And we somehow need to uh, police ourselves on that as well and just get rid of any idea uh, that uh, race is related to science talent. Uh, the teachers uh, in in my book on swimming against the tide, they wouldn't call on the minority students as often. Uh, the minority students would have their hands up. Uh, they had a hard time getting into a lab group because the other students in the class thought that uh, they would be trying to uh, get a ride, or that they weren't qualified. They're going to just try to get a ride, and that they wouldn't be contributing. So even amongst young people. The stereotype about race and ability in science uh, holds us back. And uh, between that and uh, young minority kids often have to work, uh, they don't have families uh, necessarily paying for their schooling, for their college, for their PhD. Uh, they're less likely to be recruited for uh, whether it be um, fellowships or uh, assistantships or whatever mechanisms uh, less likely to get the funding because they aren't seen as maybe uh, as promising uh, just on the basis of their skin color uh, so that that stereotype stops a lot of the funding uh, the recruitment the retention and um, in in fact some some great inventions uh, historically so much science done by all groups women, minorities, whites, we're not seeing it, we're not seeing that research, we don't get uh, uh, images of them as much, and so young uh, minority people themselves start taking on that identity. Some interesting stuff by social psychologists only works on identity. I don't care what people are telling you, I, I know this textbook, I know that teacher, I know this or that is telling you something else, but, but you could be a scientist. You do have the talent and the potential. And I, I want to mentor you and give you a chance. And, and the minute you have one person, these young women in science that I interviewed, these young minority women, as I said earlier, it's one teacher. One teacher can often uh, make the difference. So uh, financial, barriers, school barriers with less qualified teachers, less good science classrooms. Uh, they look to see who's teaching science. It's not like them. So these girls said, I look to see someone else like me who's teaching. Well, someone is teaching a business class. They look like me. I think I must be good at business. Uh, th I think that will be the area that I go into. So um, some of the same processes as for women, but slightly different natures of stereotypes. I want to mention one term, it's called stereotype threat. Um, uh, it's, it's the idea that if there's negative stereotypes about you, Katie, you're not good in science, eventually this actually affects you cognitively, that you, you can't be as good in science because you are fighting these stereotypes so hard that it lessens your, literally, your cognitive ability in that area. So it, it actually affects uh, the, the brain's ability to do the work if there's too many negative stereotypes that are threatening that image. So what does the picture look like right now? Who is doing science currently? Uh, you've written um, and referred to science as a white male culture. 
what do you mean by that? And, and what can um, white males do to make some changes? Yeah. Um, I was giving a talk at Fermi Labs up in Chicago a couple of years ago, and those are physicists, and they were from all over the world. I think it must have been a women's month or something that they decided to have me in there. Um, uh, accepting the idea that you might have gotten to where you are uh, on the basis of a system that's showing favoritism towards you is a very hard thing to do. That's difficult. We all want to think that it's our own hard work, it's our own effort. It's because we're good that we are we are. It's partly that. I mean, certainly, there's so many qualified scientists across race and gender. But um, to, to be able, even though you're favored by a system, to be able to see that favoritism is a very important thing. And so the, the movement in science does include white males that are trying to change this. It's not just women. It's not just um, women of color. Uh, there is a group of people across groups uh, that, that are saying, and it's not about men being the problem. It's about the science system and how it's set up. This is not anti-male. It's not anti-white. Uh, it's about uh, we need fair science. We don't. And who's practicing it is everyone, but not in proportion to where they are in the population. If we have 50% women in our population, if there was no bias in any occupation, then you would expect about that percent in that occupation. So uh, some people say, but girls don't like science. They opt out of science. I'm a social scientist. We are making decisions based on information and cues and networks and feedback that we're getting, and, and we're following that. So we've got um, we've got a question from the audience. Um, they, uh, this person says, "What was the biggest thing that happened to you that allowed you to survive the gauntlet?" <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'm a social scientist. It's a lot easier for us here. <laughs> um, it, it is, uh, that sounds pretty scary, that gauntlet, and I, I want to be a little bit hopeful. Uh, some of the scientists that I talked to said a tough hide, a, like a rhinoceros. Uh, you have to not let it get to you. You have to look past the uh, sometimes feedback you get that puts you in a box uh, that is, uh, somewhat limiting, and um, have enough support uh, mechanisms. Some of the places I was going to mention, like uh, there's a university, um, up in Pennsylvania, Westminster College, that um, have a very high rate of girls going into STEM. It's one of the best uh, colleges there is in the country. And uh, they have 50% women in the math and science department. Uh, that's, that's a key factor right there. Uh, other departments around the country, math and science departments, about 15% women faculty. If we can get the women faculty, then that's a mentor and a role model for the women students. So we just gotta go, the gauntlet <laughs> means that be patient, keep, keep uh, investing in our daughters and in our sons and in all young people and, uh, and, and give them support, give them career guidance and counseling. That, yes, you can do that early on, elementary school. Tell your daughters, tell your nieces, oh, um, that's interesting that uh, women who went into space, wow, I wonder what it was like for her to be in space and just uh, keep uh, uh, science camps and posters of Marie Curie or, or whoever uh, to, to um, survive what is somewhat uh, of a difficult process, but which if you bring others with you along the way uh, and support them 
uh, it will be less of a gauntlet because it's less lonely. <laughs> and uh, gauntlets are, are usually things that one person is doing and going through. And what allowed me to survive is certainly people who did have faith and did seek talent. And, and I try to um, say that uh, any one of these things could be a major factor in a change. We don't need to do it all. Well, um, we just have a little bit of time left, and so I'd like to um, maybe talk a little bit more about um, what good changes you are seeing, where you're seeing them, what um, what positive. Let's let's end on a positive note and talk a little bit about um, some of the positive things you are seeing uh, throughout the pipeline um, from early education on through um, through uh, tenured faculty or or full-time researcher. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the, some of the positive things uh, are the improvements in uh, high school science programs. Uh, sometimes we're even seeing girls taking more of these college level uh, science classes in high school than boys. Some people are worrying about boys in science right now. So uh, girls are certainly working hard at it because they know that they can't take anything for granted. So that's very positive, that's very encouraging uh, that uh, they're, they're, taking the, they're starting to take the advanced courses. I think it would be helpful, uh, many countries around the world require uh, math and science through the end of high school. You know, our system allows choices usually after 10th grade. And what we, social scientists and others that observe this see is that's where the falling out occurs. So um, I think some schools around the country are starting to say, if you're going to go into a certain uh, occupation, you actually do have to take these courses. You can't opt out of chemistry. You can't opt out of uh, chemistry and physics uh, if you plan on going in this area. So I think requiring those things is good. Uh, certainly, uh, we have women who are leading research teams now. Uh, the minute you have that, you, you're going to have a sea change because um, uh, now women can be biased too. I, I want to say that they can discriminate too. They're, they're, we're not angels. They're, they're not a group of saints waiting for, for sainthood. People in power try to keep power. So uh, when women become powerful in an area, they'll discriminate in other ways. So I guess the way that I would say my optimism is to think of it as fair to create, people are creating mechanisms for fairness by uh, making sure that we recruit all talented kids. We'll have better science, be more competitive globally, and places like the United Nations are making that a clear statement, clear statement. And their funding and their promotion of organizations is based on that assumption. You won't even have development in a country if you don't get women into education and into science. You, you can't uh, economically advanced. So I think that the optimism is the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. It's clear why we would be advantaged. And uh, some organizations and some schools are doing better than others. Uh, for example, uh, there's another small school in Minnesota that uh, is uh, making everyone feel they're good at science. Uh, they're up in, I think they're in St. Paul. And so they get They only have a small minority population, but 35% of those minorities are going into science because the whole class barrier was taken away. We're, we're funding all of you, we're supporting all of you, we're assuming all of you are, are good scientists. So I, I like the progress for people who are uh, kind of taking down these barriers, sometimes one at a time. Well, Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for, for joining us. And thanks again to the University of Arkansas Fayetteville for chapter, Sigma Psi chapter for their uh, sponsorship. And, um, and if you'd like to continue asking some follow-up questions and you're a Sigma Psi member, you can ask some on the Sigma Psi community, the lab. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Hansen. It was fascinating to hear about your research. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for asking me to come to the Hangout, and thanks to all the folks who put in questions, and I'll be happy to follow up on some more. All right, have a good one, and good luck with the research. Thank you.